It isn't often that a game changes or even begins an entire genre. And sure, it's usually not just a single game that causes this, but that single game would certainly leave its mark for players to come back to and say, oh, I see why this genre is the way it is now. Looking at the Metroidvania genre, which has had a large increase in popularity, especially across indie devs in the last few years, one may become curious as to how the early games in the style actually managed to influence it so critically. If you trace back the origins of the term Metroidvania, it actually really became coined alongside the release of Castlevania Symphony of the Night on PlayStation. But the reason for the name is due to how much inspiration the Castlevania team took from previous Metroid titles, especially with how the world is structured. And the fact that fans are still eagerly awaiting the next entry in the Metroid series after so many years must mean this game truly was impactful for the entire course of adventure gaming. And honestly, playing this 33 year old game was truly some of the most fun I've had with a video game in years, and I'll explain exactly why as we figure out What's so great about Metroid? Let me take you guys down the rabbit hole of how I started playing this game, and what my first impressions were, because this episode was not even intended to be about Metroid. In fact, I had started playing Hollow Knight because I had heard such great things about it over the last few years. But a few hours into playing, I thought about the fact that I had never actually played a full Metroidvania game before so I really had nothing to compare it to. I did a little searching online and discovered that HowLongToBeat.com shows many of the Metroid and Castlevania games lasting a fraction of the playtime for Hollow Knight, so I figured I would just knock a couple of them out for comparisons and started with the original, of course, Metroid on NES, but I had no clue how into this game I would get. So the first time I tried the game, I went in completely blind, and within about an hour was incredibly confused and reaching multiple dead ends. Then I decided to look up the NES manual online because several of these games back in the 80s actually required you to do a little reading just to get the basics in. And let me tell you, you have to read the manual for this game. There's virtually no way to understand your goal without it which is a big reason Metroidvania games are the way they are now, because the layout of the worlds in these games are a staple of the genre, yes, but the development of the story is an equally important criteria. But the manual gives you more than the basic mechanics and an opening story. This little inbox manual is basically your referential field guide. For instance, through the manual, you know that there are extra energy tanks out there and 10 possible upgrades to Samus's suit, not only does it tell you there are 10 items, but it shows you what they all are, so you can even have a little checklist of items to look out for. The manual also tells you how to deal damage to certain enemies, and the fact that you'll need to attack the walls because not everything is going to be obvious as you play. And of course, the all-important map is in there. But unfortunately, it's little more than a cartoon mock-up of the general layout of the whole game, so it gives you a sense of where you may be, but of course, no real details. But I figured that would be a good enough jumping off point, so, after reading the manual and seeing the little map, I figured I stood a better chance and headed back into Zebes, and once again, got lost in this alien labyrinth. So I took what the manual said to heart, and started making my own map. That's right, even the manual says you might as well draw your own map, and oddly enough, that is when I got hooked. I can honestly say that I have never been so absorbed into exploring a game because this felt like actual exploration. I had to discover the world, I had to learn its secrets and map them all out. There was not even a map for me to fill in in-game, so I actually had to fill in the blanks on my own piece of paper just to make sure I had seen every possible corner of this game. Once you're actually putting it on paper, you can clearly see the amount of content Nintendo crammed into this little cartridge with the way the tunnels of the world snake through each other to maximize space. Once I started seeing the patterns and layouts, the whole Fortress of Zeebs started making so much more sense in terms of where I needed to go as well as where secrets might be. This is exploration in its truest form. There was little to no guidance in these early home video games, and exploration in one form or another was crucial. But teaching your player to actually understand the way the world is laid out is so much more difficult to do than just providing them with a map, but Metroid made it work. There were a couple ways people could approach the discovery of games like these back on the NES. The first was obviously to do exactly what I did, and time-consumingly draw out the map, and second would have been to buy the Nintendo Power or whatever magazine guide you could get your hands on to walk you through the game. And the third option, of course, is brute force. And Metroid still keeps itself open to this. 
I know that even though I geeked out over the opportunity to make a glorified spreadsheet, that not everyone who wants to play this game will also want to take the time to draw the whole thing out. Of course not. That's simply not interesting to everybody. But as long as you keep making discoveries on your own time, Metroid supports you in however you want to play. For example, the game is split into a few sections, including Brinstar, Norfair, and Turian, as well as the mini-boss hideouts. Depending on where you're exploring when you die, you'll be sent back to the entrance of that section, which is incredibly generous for a game-over, insert-password-style game like this, where, in technical aspects, it wouldn't have been unheard of for them to just send you back to the beginning of the game. Not only this, but any red doors you've blasted open, stay open. So if you're down on your luck and used all your missiles right before you died, you can still get around no problem before you stock back up. There are also aspects of the game and experience that simply don't come from a map or a manual. Noticing patterns in the rooms and discovering where secrets and tunnels may be hiding comes straight from play and discovery on your own. And you'll also start learning how to take advantage of the game's technical limitations, such as utilizing the sprite limit to farm energy or avoid being overrun, as some enemies will just keep spawning unless you can find a way to make everything slow down for a moment. There is one aspect of the game that I need to be a little more critical of, because it did give me a lot of grief while playing, even once I got the hang of things. One of the things that definitely slows this game down, and you can decide whether you think this is a negative or positive aspect, but I personally am not necessarily a fan of this, is the fact that there is no way to discern which blocks are either bombable or straight up incorporeal, which makes it very hard to realize where you've missed something. There are certain patterns or things that line up in either specific or flat out odd ways which draws your eye and makes you think there may be something more going on there. Those instances of guiding the player are terrific. But the other end of things, where there is no discernible way to know that that single block four spaces from the bottom right corner of a vertical hallway's dead end actually needs to be bombed in your ball form, makes things a lot more tiresome when you realize you've seen every possible dead end that you know of, and now you have to retrace your steps, re-bombing and shooting every single wall, ceiling, and floor until you finally stumble across that secret path. Now, the argument against that is clearly the fact that, as I just referred to them, these are secrets. They're not meant to be obvious, but even Nintendo's other early titles had at least some methods of guiding the player towards these hidden pieces of the game, such as showing in Super Mario Bros. that the very top of the level is accessible in some instances, so maybe keep that in mind. Or in The Legend of Zelda, some pieces of your dungeon maps may seem odd not to be filled in. Well, maybe I should bomb that wall or push a block, because those are the only few options you have at least inside the dungeons. Don't even get me started on looking for secrets outside in the Zelda world, because that's just a whole other mess of finding secrets with little to no guidance. And maybe that's the trade-off in this instance of Metroid here. You have the hints that guide you to the existence of these secrets, but the true mass of this game by NES standards leads players into a maze of options, for better or worse. Aside from the little things like individual blocks, let's talk about something big and obvious, the bosses. What's really interesting about the bosses in this game is the way they're built up to in a dramatic fashion. Obviously, Kraid, for instance, didn't start off in a technical sense as the multi-screen monster he became in later games. He was still going to be a little sprite, relatively speaking, just like any big bosses from these retro games. They could only be so big, and there could only be so much going on in a boss fight due to technical limitations, so instead, the atmosphere had to grow leading up to each boss. First off, they're mentioned by name and image in the manual, so you know who you're looking for, but you don't really know where, or what it means for them to be mini-bosses, like what do you need to be prepared for? The fact that you have to take an elevator to each of their lairs specifically separates you from the areas of Zebes that you're already familiar with. Then, in the room right before you fight Kraid, you're greeted by a starkly different design that stands out from the rest of the game, telling you that you've reached something special. Also, the fact that the developers give you an unlimited spawning, easy-to-kill creature to stock up on energy and missiles before your fight. Just like in big open-world games, where you'll find a bunch of health items outside the last room of a dungeon and you think, well, whatever's on the other side of that door sure won't be happy to see me. And boy do the bosses in this game give you a run for your money. You can be armed to the teeth, and there's still just something humiliating about the way Kraid takes every shot on the chin and keeps on fighting. It's genuinely unnerving to have no clue how close you may be to beating him, and questioning whether or not you're prepared at all. Are you two missiles away and need to power through, or have you barely made a dent and need to bail before you lose everything? 
Now, Kraid is only the first boss, and I don't want to get into too much detail about the later fights with Ridley, Mother Brain, and even the Metroids floating around Turian, but they all present much different challenges, especially when the majority of tools at your disposal come down to jump, shoot, and maybe roll up and run away. Maximizing your skill set by taking these challenges head on is pretty brutal, but in this fast paced NES game, that is the most fitting way to charge through a base full of dangerous aliens and enemies. Some of the topics I've covered today also had references to why they were the way they were due to technical restrictions at the time, and honestly, that just makes this game so much more impressive. The fact that there were no save files, there were pretty severe sprite limits, and screen after screen was reused in order to save space. Yet somehow, this place, this space pirate base of Zebes, feels like a massive world where anything helpful or harmful could be just around the corner, and you, as the greatest bounty hunter out there, have to use your wits and reflexes to amass your arsenal and show this complex maze that there's nothing you can't figure out. I know that not everyone wants to draw a map of the game they're playing, and some people will flat out find that annoying, but I don't think that's really what this game is demonstrating. That's just the way I focused on the fun of exploring a new game, and there is so much exploration to be had here, but I think all of this just proves how brilliantly Metroid is structured. Sometimes it's weird to think about why any certain game would stand the test of time or be popular enough to warrant sequels for decades to come. My limited experience with Metroid was just Samus' appearance in the Super Smash Bros. series, but upon playing this 33-year-old game, it's clear why this little space adventure became a staple of early Nintendo, with many fans still waiting for the newest installment. And that is what's so great about Metroid. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of What's So Great About Gaming, as we explore the mysteries of Metroid. Make sure to tell us what you think about Metroid, or even suggest a game for another video. If you want to hear what's great about another game, check out the link to our last episode, Celeste, on screen or in the description. And please take the time to subscribe to be involved in the discussions here. Thanks again for watching. Now go play a great game. We'll see you next time.